Good day and welcome to our online service today. We are glad that you can join us. And as we begin, let us prepare our hearts as we read this psalm. Psalm 18. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my savior. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am safe from my enemies. With the faithful, you show yourself faithful. With the blameless, you prove yourself blameless. With the pure, you show yourself pure. And with the crooked, you show yourself astute. For you save an afflicted people, but you humiliate haughty eyes. For you light my lamp, the Lord my God illumines my darkness. Let us praise the Lord.
are good, you are good When there's nothing good in me You are love, you are love On display for all to see You are light, you are light When the darkness closes in You are hope, you are hope You have covered all my sins is crippling you are true you are true in, in, in my wandering you are joy you are joy you're the reason that i sing you are alive you are alive in you death has lost its sting of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever rain you are more you are more than my words will
Good day again to all of you and welcome back. We are nearing the end of our study in the book of Malachi entitled Restructuring Your Faith. Today we'll look at Malachi chapter 3 verses 13 to 18. Please open your Bibles with me and follow along. This passage is the final debate between God and His people. But before we proceed, let us first take a quick review. The people in Malachi's day had been back in the land of Judea for almost a hundred years now. But even though they were no longer in exile physically, they were still in exile spiritually. Why? Because their hearts were very far from God. Because of their unanswered prayers and unmet expectations, the people became disappointed with God. And what did they do? First, the peoples of Israel doubted God's love. Second, they dishonored the Lord by offering Him unacceptable sacrifices. Third, they broke their marriage covenant and by divorcing their spouse and marrying ungodly women. Fourth, the people questioned God's justice. Fifth, they rob God of their tithes and they withhold their offerings to Him. And sixth, the people spoke arrogantly against the Lord. And this is what we'll look at today. Malachi chapter 3, verse 13 to 15. Your words have been arrogant against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said, it is pointless to serve God. And what benefit is it for us that we have done what he required and that we have walked in mourning before the Lord of the armies? So now we call the arrogant blessed. Not only are the doers of wickeds built up, but they also put God to the test and escape punishment. This is the last topic or the final case that the Lord brought to his people's attention. And he directly said to them, Your words have been arrogant against me. God told his people that they have spoken hurtful words against him. And how did they reply? Again, for the seventh time in this book, they claim innocence. Instead of repenting, they remain proud. They denied God's accusation and said, What have we spoken against you? But again, God proved them guilty by exposing the hardness of their hearts. And the Lord told them, You have said it is pointless to serve God and what benefit is it for us that we have done what He required and that we have walked in mourning before the Lord of armies. So now we call the arrogant blessed. Not only are the doers of the wicked spilled up, but they also put God to the test and escape punishment. Did you hear that? The people said to God, and they said to each other, It is pointless to serve God. Serving God is useless. Worshipping, tithing, obeying God, these are all pointless. It's just a waste of our time, money, and energy. Now, why do these people think that way? The second part of their response gives us a clue. They said, What benefit is it for us that we have done what He required? What profit have we gained by obeying His commands? In other words, the people said, what's in it for us? What's in it for me? Nothing. Did you see the problem there? The people were self-focused and greedy. They treated their relationship with the Lord like a business transaction. What will it, I get out of this? They asked. Sadly, the people don't want God. All they wanted were the things that they could get from God. The people only wanted to have the gifts and not the giver. Now, it would have been understandable if those words were spoken by pagan people, those who do not follow the Lord. But sadly, it is the people of God who uttered these words, and that is why God was deeply hurt. As a perfect, loving, and faithful husband, God did everything for his wife, Israel. And yet his wife, Israel, told him, What did I gain by marrying you? Nothing. This relationship is worthless. Imagine if your spouse told you that. I'm sure you would be deeply hurt, right? And that is how God felt. His heart was broken because his people said, it is pointless to serve God. There is no benefit in following him. Dear friends, are you in a similar situation today? Maybe you started with the heart on fire for God. You passionately follow the Lord Jesus and you serve him with everything you've got. But like the people during Malachi's time, maybe you have stopped serving God. Perhaps your seal for the Lord significantly diminished because you no longer see why it matters. Perhaps you used to do the right things. You did your best to fight your temptations. You did your best to deal honestly in your business, to give your tithes, to volunteer in ministry. And you did your best to love your spouse and your family and your children sacrificially. 
But then you came to a point where you no longer try as hard or maybe you have stopped doing this altogether because you think that it's not worth to keep up the fight. Maybe you feel that it's no longer worth it to continue and make the sacrifices. Just be honest right now. Are you saying in your heart that you're serving God in vain? Do you say it's worthless? It's pointless? And do you think that you have gained nothing by obeying the Lord? If that is the case, then you have deeply hurt God by what you say or think. He knows about it and He hears both of your spoken and unspoken words. Now, why did the people of Israel utter these terrible words against the Lord? Because this is what they concluded, verse 15. So now we call the arrogant blessed. Not only are the doers of the wickedness built up, but they also put God to the test and escape punishment. You see, the people were convinced that those who do evil get rich and those who break God's rules suffer no harm. Those who put God to the test get away with it. And actually, these statements echo what Asaph said in Psalm 73. Asaph served the Lord faithfully. He faithfully served God as a worship leader in his temple during the time of King David. But there was something about his life that uh, he observed and it shook his faith to the core. And listen to what he said, Psalm 73. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. Listen to this. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts come iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Thus the Most High know anything. And this is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. Like the people of Israel, Aesop started out believing that God is good. But as he observed life and suffered affliction, he experienced a crisis of faith. And so he asked, is God really good? If he is, then why do the wicked prosper? Why do bad People have the good things in life. They don't seem to suffer. The wicked reject God and yet their lives seem to be comfortable and pain-free. They are financially secure and healthy. They are proud. They indulge in sinful living, yet they remain unpunished. This, this doesn't make sense. It is not fair. Is God really good? Why do godly people suffer and the ungodly prosper? Dear brothers and sisters, are these your questions as well? If you're in a difficult situation now, if your faith is being stretched to the limit during this season in your life, I want to encourage you. Yes, life is hard. Life can be very hard and difficult, but you don't have to give up. Don't be discouraged. And I hope and pray that you would hold on to God. Stand firm in your faith because your suffering is not the final word in your life. Why do I say that? Let's continue. Verse 16 to 18. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened attentively and heard it. And the book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and esteem his name. And they will be mine, says the Lord of armies. Suffering is not the final word in our lives. Why? Because this is what Malachi teaches us. Those who revere God will be remembered and rewarded. Those who revere God will be remembered and rewarded. Verse 16 tells us, that those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. Actually, during Malachi's time, there were two groups of people. The first group, as we've seen earlier, were speaking against God. But this group in verse 16 is a people, is a group of people who was speaking in awe of God. This group feared the Lord, while the first group was frustrated with God. But here's what's interesting. Both of these groups, they have the same experiences. Let me explain. Both groups have experienced difficulties. They suffered poverty and hardships when they got back in the land. Both of them were waiting on God's 
promise to be fulfilled and both did not receive what they expected. Both groups went through the same trials and suffering, and yet they had opposite responses. The first group reacted sinfully against God. They reacted in anger and frustration. They doubted God's love and questioned Him. They dishonored the Lord through their words and actions. They broke their covenant and He, and they disobeyed God. But for the second group, despite being in the same situation as the first one, they responded differently. They continued fearing the Lord and trusted Him. They revered and esteemed His name through their words and actions. They remained faithful to their covenant with God and they obeyed His commands. Now let me ask you, which group do you belong to? Are you in the first group or the second one? In the midst of your trials, do you speak arrogant word against God or do you remain faithful and revere His name? Which group do you belong to? Last June 2020, preacher and author Timothy Keller shared in his tweet that he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. But here is how he responded in his deadly trial in his life. I have terrific human doctors, but most importantly, I have the great physician himself caring for me. Though we have had many times of shock and fear, God has been remarkably present with me through all many tests, biopsies, and surgeries of the past weeks. And here is one of his prayer requests. For Kathy and me, that we use this opportunity to be weaned from the joys of this world and to desire God's presence above all. And he ended his tweet with this, Running the race set before me with joy, because Jesus ran an infinitely harder race for me, with joy for me. Did you hear that? Running the race set before me with joy, because Jesus ran an infinitely harder race for me. What a display of faith and reverence for God. We all know that another Christian can also be diagnosed with the same sickness and responded in exact opposite way. Two believers can experience the same trials, but one can turn out and turn his back from God while the other draws closer to God. Same situation, different response. Again, which group do you belong to? Are you in the first one or the second one? As you face your difficulties, do you speak arrogant words against God? Or do you remain faithful and revere his name? Let's look again at verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened attentively and heard it. We don't know exactly what this group said to each other, but I believe they were words that edify each other. They talked to each other, they built each other up, they encouraged them to put their faith in God, and this group talked about God and to each other as they shared their hearts, they cried together and they confessed and they encouraged one another and prayed together to build each other up. Now let me ask you, do you have friends that you can do that with? Do you have a group of people that you meet and after getting together, you come away with a more profound reverence for God? I hope you do. But if not, I hope you can find a group. Find a group that will help you to run away from sin, to encourage you to press on, to run the Christian race, and find a group that will will inspire you to finish well. If you don't have a group like that, I encourage you to look for one. Join our life groups and get connected with us. Again, let's look at verse 16. What did God do? The Lord listened attentively and heard it. Now, the the word listen attentively in Hebrew is kashab. It means to prick up the ear, like a deer raising its ear when hearing a sudden noise. It is a word picture of hearing even the faint of the sound. And the word heard is shema, which means to listen with special interest and concern. Now, isn't it amazing to think that when we're discussing about God in our groups, in our life groups, in our journey groups, in our discipleship groups, the Lord is interested to hear what we have to say about Him. In other words, God loves listening to the conversations of those who revere His name. He pays close attention. Now let's continue. As I've said, suffering is not the final word in our lives. Why? Because those who revere God will be remembered and rewarded. Notice what God did for those who feared Him. Verse 16, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened attentively and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before Him for those who feared the Lord and esteem His name. After God listened, a book of remembrance was written for those who revere Him. Now, what is this book? Before that, let me highlight this. God does not need written records to keep track of what He needs to remember. Why? Because our God is the all-knowing God and He remembers all. 
And now do you know what else God remembers? The psalmist tells us, Psalm 56, You have taken account of my miseries, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Dear friends, God will remember even our tears. And this is an encouragement to us. Even our cries are not wasted on Him. They matter to God. He records them in His book as well because He loves us. So what is this book of remembrance? Here the prophet Malachi used a metaphor which the people would have easily understood. Note that the people lived during the period of the Persian Empire and they were familiar with their cultural practices. You see, the kings of Persia kept a book of records or a book of remembrance. It is a royal diary that records the name of those who rendered service to the king and those who did any beneficial deed to the kingdom. This document was kept safe so that those loyal servants might be rewarded in due time. And the book of Esther contains an example of this. Do you remember that name of character written in the book of remembrance? Let's see. Esther chapter 6. During that night, the king, that's King Ahasuerus of Persia, he could not sleep, so he gave an order to bring the book of records. That's the book of remembrance, the chronicles. And they were read before the king, and it was found written that Mordecai had reported about Bigthana and Theresh, two of the king's eunuch, who were doorkeepers, that they had sought to attack King Ahasuerus. Then the king said, What honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servant who attended him said, Nothing has done for him. You see, Mordecai discovered a plot to assassinate the king. Credit was given to his name for saving the king's life, but he was not yet rewarded for it. Now, it is also important to note that the Persian king's reward to his loyal servants was, were often delayed, and just like here in the case of Mordecai. And that is why the Book of Remembrance was needed so that every loyal deed done for the king won't be left unrewarded. And this is what God reminded his people just as the Persian king set a day to reward his loyal servants, the Lord will also do the same for his faithful ones. Malachi chapter 3, verse 17. And they will be mine, says the Lord, on that day, on that day when I prepare my own possession. This is God's way of encouraging those who are serving him faithfully. He's saying, it may seem now that revering me is useless, that the things you do for me are left uh, unrewarded, but don't lose heart because I am taking note, I am keeping record. And on that day, I will honor those who honor me and I will reward those who remain faithful to me. And the Apostle Paul tells us more about this day, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive compensation for his deeds done through the body in accordance with what he has done, whether good or bad. Now at this point, allow me to discuss more with you about the concept of eternal rewards. Let me share with you two common misconceptions about this. The first, everybody will be equal in heaven. This is incorrect. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 tells us, each one's work will become evident for the day, there's that word again, will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work which he has built on remains, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet only so as through fire. You see, some people will barely make it to heaven. Instead of receiving rewards, they will suffer loss. Not everybody will be equal in heaven. The truth is, there will be varying degrees of reward in heaven. And Dr. Wayne Grudem, author of Systematic Theology book, said this, The idea of degrees of reward is an encouragement for us to strive for greater reward in heaven. You see, when we stand before Jesus to give an account of our lives, He will say to one person, You shall have authority over ten cities, and to another, You are to be over five cities, according to Luke 19. When we look at the parable of the ten minas in Luke 19 and the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, this suggests that there will be levels of responsibility or different kinds of stewardship that God will entrust to different people. And what will be entrusted to us in the future is based on our faithfulness. What will be entrusted to us in the future is based on our faithfulness with what God has assigned to us today. As our Lord Jesus Christ said, the one who is faithful in a very little thing is also faithful in much, and the one who is unrighteous in a very little thing is also unrighteous in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will then entrust the true wealth 
to you. So may God help us. And so, dear friends, think about it. What are those that God has entrusted you today during this season in, in your life? Is it parenting your kids? Is it your work or business? Is it leading your discipleship group or teaching your students? Is it your studies? Or is it pursuing a new ministry opportunity? However big or small it may be, remain faithful to the end. Persevere in doing good. Don't give up even if it's difficult and even if you're discouraged. Press on and serve God. Live with eternity in mind and run to win. Let us revere the Lord through our thoughts, words, and action. Why? Because as one author said, the person you are today will determine the rewards you will receive tomorrow. The person you are today will determine the rewards you will receive tomorrow. Now don't misunderstand me. Yes, our salvation is by grace through faith. It is by grace alone and not by works. But remember, our eter eternal reward is determined by our faithfulness in our work. Our eternal reward is determined by our faithfulness in our works today. And so may God help us. And don't forget that those who revere God will be remembered and rewarded. Those who re revere God will be remembered and rewarded. Now, this is the second misconception about rewards. It is wrong to be motivated by rewards. This is again incorrect. Many of us Christians feel that the desire for reward is a sign of spiritual weakness. We think that we should obey and serve God purely out of love for Him, and which is correct. We think they, that wanting a reward should somehow negate the purity of our obedience. But here's the truth. God created us and wired us to desire rewards. Isn't it that we are motivated by rewards in all the areas of our lives? At home, at school, and even at work? We all like rewards. We like airline miles, credit card reward points, cashback rebates, and even business leaders know the importance of giving incentives and bonuses to their people. The same is true with parenting. You know, my wife, for the longest time, uh, we have a niece um, named Paige, and my wife has struggled in, uh, in teaching her to do her morning routine by herself. But you know what helped uh, my wife uh, have a breakthrough in helping Paige? My wife came up with a rewards chart. And so whenever my niece um, did her morning ritual, she will get a start. And at the end of the week, we will tally it and we will give them prizes. And so here's another truth and concept about the reward. In reality, the concept of reward is God's idea. The concept of eternal reward is God's idea. Just look at the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his longest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this three times in Matthew 6. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. The father will reward you. And the father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And also, teaching about the cause of discipleship, Jesus said this in Matthew 16. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For the Son of Man is going to come in glory of his father with his angels and will then repay every person according to his deeds. Did you see that? The concept of reward comes from the Lord himself, and God will reward his faithful servants. Now understand that the ultimate reward will happen when our Lord Jesus comes again. However, since God is our loving Father and he is a generous rewarder, he also rewards us immediately in this life. God allows us to experience the blessing and reward for our obedience in this lifetime. But take note, he determines how and when he would reward and bless us. Let me repeat that. In this life, God determines how and when He will reward us. Now, here's the problem for the people of during Malachi's time. The problem was not that they were looking forward to the reward from God. Their, their problem was that they desired the reward more than they desired God. The people treated God as if He owes them something. And as we've learned before, these people had expectations of how and when God should reward them. They wanted to receive material blessings and rewards from God, and they wanted to receive those rewards right here, right now. And when they did not receive what they expected from God, what did they do? They turned away and left God. So dear friends, let us be careful what we desire. It's okay to desire blessing and reward from God, but let Him determine it for us. Let us be faithful and wait on God, and let us wait for God's favor according to His time and His ways. Now, what will God do to His people? How will He reward those who revere Him? 
Let's go back again to Malachi chapter 3, verse 17. And they will be mine, says the Lord of the armies. On that day, I prepare my own possession. First, there will be recognition. On that day, when God will reward his true people, he will recognize those who truly belong to him. God will say to them, they will be mine. The word mine here is emphatic. They will say, they will be mine. Mine alone. They will be my treasure and my special possession. Again, think about your life. Will you be part of God's treasured possession? Or will you be just like a smelly trash that will be thrown outside because it's worthless? I love what Erwin Luther said. God will inspect the rubies as well as the rubble. In the presence of Christ, our outer image will give way to the reality of our inner character. And this leads us to the last point. On that day, God said, I will have compassion for them just as a man has compassion for his own son who serves him. So you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. And what else will God do? There will be distinctions. Remember, the people in Malachi's time were accusing God of being unjust. They were questioning his character because he seemed to be sparing the wicked. But God reminded them, judgment is coming. And when his day of judgment comes, the wicked won't be spared. Only God's children will be spared. And he will save his people from the coming wrath. Listen to what the Apostle John wrote in Revelation 20. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Revelation 20, 13, 15. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and the death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death, and anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. On that day, when Christ comes again, it will be apparent to all who are his children and who are not. You see, there is no middle ground. Either your God declares that you are righteous or wicked, either you're alive in Christ or dead in your sins. Now, if you're asking, how can I escape God's coming judgment? What should I do to make sure that my name is written in God's book of remembrance? I'm glad you asked. The Bible tells us in Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 14, For by the grace of God has appeared Christ Jesus, bringing salvation to all people, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and in a godly manner in the present age, looking for a blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, eager for good deeds. God sent his son Jesus to us for a mission, and that is to rescue us from the wrath to come. Jesus was born and he lived a righteous life. He died for our sins on the cross and he rose again from the dead on the third day. And to those who receive him and believe in his name, God will declare them as his children. God will spare them from the coming judgment. Now, is this the desire of your heart? Then repent of your sins and return to God. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in him. Turn away from serving idols and serve the living and true God. Rely on God's Spirit to live righteously. Revere God by denying ungodliness and worldly desires. Do not forget, those who revere God will be remembered and rewarded. Now let me close with this. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. And isn't it interesting that one of God's last words to his people was about rewards? Before God became silent for the next 400 years, he left his people with this promise and encouragement. So you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. And this also applies to us as well. Brothers and sisters, life may be hard now. We may have unanswered prayers and unrewarded efforts, but it doesn't mean that God has forgotten us. You see, God's delay does not mean God's denials. Our rewards may not come now, but the Lord remembers, and He will surely reward those who remain faithful and revere His name. 
So let us persevere. Let us strive to obey despite the tears and the difficulties. And may the words of the Apostle Paul remind us. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be firm, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You see, nothing that we do for God is useless. Everything that we do for the Lord is meaningful. Again, may this truth encourage us. Those who revere the Lord will be remembered and rewarded. Those who revere God will be remembered and rewarded. And just as the last book of the Old Testament mentions about rewards, so does the last book of the New Testament. In the midst of God's people suffering, Jesus Christ encouraged them to persevere and overcome until the end. Now let's listen to the word of our Lord Jesus Christ himself and let this encourage us. Revelation 22. Let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let the one who is filthy still be filthy and let the one who is righteous continue practice righteousness and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to reward each one as his work deserves. Let us remember, those who revere God will be remembered and rewarded. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the message of Malachi. Thank you, Lord, for your promise that you will reward those who revere you and who remain faithful. Forgive us, our Lord, because many times we tend to forget, especially when we are discouraged by our trials, by our suffering, especially when we see people around us who do not follow you and it seems that they are living better lives. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for our lack of faith. Help us, Lord God, to have a perspective, Lord God, that sees the reality according to your eyes, and that you will reward each one according to our faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for your Son, Jesus, that in you we have salvation, and that out of your love and generosity we can become children of God and we can be heirs, Lord God, with Christ. Thank you, Lord, because we can look forward to the reward that you will give us as we remain faithful. Lord, I pray for those who are discouraged, Lord God, in their walk with you right now. Help them, Lord God, to have the strength of heart. Help them, Lord God, to see things through the light of eternity. And may you empower them. I pray for those who are tired, Lord God. I pray that you help them, empower them, Lord God, to have the strength, Lord God, to persevere, to press on so that they can finish well. I pray, Lord God, for those who are desiring, Lord God, to receive um, their rewards, Lord God, but they are discouraged, Lord God, by the trials that they face. I pray that you help them, Lord God, and just be with them, comfort them with your presence, enable them, Lord God, to realize that they are not alone, that you will not leave them nor forsake them. Lord, I pray, Lord God, for all of us, help us, Lord God, to live in light of eternity. Help us, Lord God, to revere and honor your name. Enable us, Father God, to just have that focus, Lord God, to be faithful, Lord God, to serve you wholeheartedly. And we look forward to that day, Lord God, when we see you face to face. And we are looking forward to also hear from you, telling us, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you, Lord, for today. And we just commit to you the rest of our time. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the life that you've given us and for the future that you are preparing for us. Thank you, Lord. And all these things we pray. Through the name of our Master and our Rewarder, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and Amen. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope and pray that God's Word empowered us to face another week. At this point, I encourage you to have your family talk, share with each other what you've learned, and think of specific ways how you can apply what you've learned this week. May God bless us all. See you again next time.